Assalamu alaikum. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar of Reservoir Geomechanics Fundamentals. This is the Reservoir. This is Abdullah from Reservoir Solutions team. So before, before starting our session for the day, we just wanted to introduce our next course of production optimization. The production optimization course would cover several topics about the production optimization, like the nodal analysis, reservoir performance, the wheel performance, perforation design, tubing, size, selection, wheel stimulation, evaluation, artificial lift, ESP design, gas lift design, network modeling, and IBR construction for horizontal wheels and water flood walls. The course will extend for seven days that will be hands-on experience also, for the course fees is only 50, 50 USD for professional and for students is only 30, uh, 30 USD for students. Okay, so thank you for all. For our course, for our uh, session today, I wanted to introduce our instructor, our instructor for our today's session. Engineer Islam Shaheen. Islam Shaheen is a senior geology and geomechanics specialist, holds a master's degree with nine years of experience in oil and gas industry, working for Aminix Petroleum Egypt Limited, and also pursuing MBA degree. Possess incredible written and verbal communication skills, excellent interpersonal skills ability to gain more knowledge and quick learn. He is also geomechanics instructor, teaching geomechanics courses to different colleagues from different GV functions, companies, and different countries, like Schlumberger and Baker Hughes, the, and in also in Iraq, Amapitku and Nuspitku and Fan Bitku. Thank you for all attendees. So if you have any questions, please drop into, into the Zoom chat. Also, the link for the course registration will be sent onto the Zoom chat. If you want to get a certificate for this webinar, we will send a link for Google form to be filled to get your certificate. So thank you all and engineer Islam, you can start now. Okay, well. So you can speak engineer Islam now. Hello everyone. I hope yeah. you are all fine and you are fa your family are very fine in these uh, days. My name is Islam Shaheen, as Abrahman said. Uh, I'm a senior uh, structure and geomechanic uh, engineer and geologist. I have been working, I have experience around uh, 12 years in oil and gas industry and uh, geothermal industry, renewable energy. Uh, I have been working with uh, Aminix Petroleum Egypt, it's a company, it's an exploration upstream company that uh, have been working in Egypt. Uh, and later on in 2020, I have joined a company called Seashell, uh, uh, almost a startup company in uh, oil and gas surfacing and uh, renewable energy also, exploration and surfacing. So uh, our, uh, our topic today will be about the fundamental of geomechanics. How, what, what we meant by geomechanics, uh, what are the application of geomechanics in oil and gas uh, industry and other industry like uh, uh, carbon dioxide storage, the exploitations and the renewable energy industry. So- uh, uh, Engineer Islam, please share your screen. Okay, I will be sharing it right now. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So, uh, uh, fundamental of 
Cannabis is a huge course that have been teaching for the last uh, four to five years to many companies, students, and professionals. The, the course can be summarized as, as the following. Uh, introduction to geomechanics, in this, top, in this section, we will talk about uh, ports of geomechanics. We will talk about the tectonic stress field and calculating what we call the vertical stress or the least static stress or the overburden stress. Also, we are going to uh, get some information uh, for uh, drilling basic for geologists. Second topic would be uh, port pressure and fracture pressure, uh, definition of port pressure and the causes of uh, over port pressure, uh, definition of fracture gradient, estimating the port pressure, uh, calibration using the pressure data, leak of test, and extended leak of test. After then, uh, this course also includes the mechanical earth properties. Uh, after then, we have a topic on measuring stress orientation, measuring stress magnitude, application to drilling, uh, application of geomechanics to drilling, trap integrity and induced seismicity, application of uh, geomechanics to reservoir depletion. So uh, on today's webinar, we will knock the door uh, only at the introduction to geomechanics. What is meant by geomechanics? Uh, what is a geomechanics? The application of geomechanics in uh, uh, either the uh, oil and gas industry or the renewable energy industry. So let me start. My, uh, my journey with geomechanics be began, has begun in 2011. Uh, I have been knocking the door to the huge or big three service company. Uh, Schlumberger, uh, Baker Hughes, and Halliburton. So uh, this company have uh, a, a, a button in their uh, in their website called Technical Challenge. Technical Challenge. This this is the technical challenge facing oil and gas industry at this moment. But uh, uh, nowadays, uh, geomechanics uh, are, are, are is not being a technical challenge because it has been well developed by uh, this service company and have been developed all over the world. So uh, Schlumberger, as you see, we have here, uh, let me go to the pointer section. We have here the geomechanics, it's being a technical challenge. We have also in the uh, Halliburton, we have a technical challenge, it's petroleum geomechanics. And also in the bigger use, we have the technical challenge in geomechanics. This is the challenge started, uh, as I said, I said before, it is starting in 2011. Uh, okay, uh, what is the main issue of geomechanics related to business industry, related to oil and gas as a business industry? Uh, cost wasting, cost wasting, six billion annual cost to the industry uh, is related to the problem arises from drilling uh, uh, production and uh, uh, well completion. These problems are mainly related to geomechanics, to the rock mechanics, how we can deal with the rock beneath the earth. Also, uh, shell cute is a 2 million to 100 million uh, well cost in, well poor in stability cost. This is a huge, a huge uh, number for uh, for uh, for a big company like Shell. So, geomechanics is a branch deal with deals with understanding how the rock stress, pressure, and temperature interact. This is uh, it is integrated uh, 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 discipline that uh, gathers data from drilling and reservoir engineering, gathers data from geophysics, gathers data from also better physics. Okay. So we can you please put the, it is already in the presentation mode. Okay. It's already in the presentation of the, the presentation is already in the presentation mode. So let's, let's just continue. So uh, the geomechanics uh, life cycle from uh, drilling to inflation to production uh, can be summarized in this picture. Uh, they, uh, 
the first use of geomechanics is to uh, to specify the casing points. Second uh, point will be the overpressure zone, how to deal with the abnormal pressures. Second uh, sector the, the, uh, where the, we can use geomechanics is the where poor instability or the or stuck pipe. Then we have the loss of circulation issues that interrupts with drilling. Uh, we can use uh, also geomechanics in fracturing, hydraulic fracking. We can use also uh, geomechanics in uh, sand production. Okay. okay. So we can use uh, the, uh, the geomechanics to, uh, to, to mitigate uh, what we call the induced seismicity. And we are going to break through uh, what's meant by the induced seismicity. Also, uh, in compaction, in reservoir compaction, we can use uh, geomechanics to mitigate what we call in the reservoir compaction or collapse. Also, from the exploration point of view, we can use geomechanics in uh, an exploration term called trap integrity. Uh, trap integrity is, uh, is measuring how, uh, how, how Ghana, the trap, can a, a, a specified quantity of hydrocarbon before it's being fractured. Even though a trap is being uh, completely laterally sealed by a fault or what, or, or what also, or uh, by uh, vertically sealed by a cap rock, this trap can be blown. What, mean, what I mean by blowing, it can be fractioning and the hydrocarbon can uh, migrate to another compartment. This is a uh, very, uh, very uh, uh, phenomena that's happened mainly, mainly in gas, uh, gas reservoir. As we have here in Egypt, in the Mediterranean Sea region, we have a plenty of uh, blowing uh, traps in Egypt. So uh, geomechanics can help also in the exploration phase. Geomechanics mainly, our modeling of geomechanics mainly can be uh, uh, held by knowing the magnitude and the stress acting on, oil, on oils. This is stress can be uh, classified into two mainly stresses according to, to uh, their direction. We have the vertical stress and we have the horizontal stresses. So the vertical stress, we call it, it is uh, vertical or the least static or the overburning stress. It is the stress comes from the overlying or the overburden of the uh, above rocks in the earth, okay? Uh, so, and uh, we have the, uh, the uh, horizontal stress, which is mainly, uh, can be classified into uh, the, uh, the uh, least, least uh, principal horizontal stress and the maximum horizontal stress, okay? And also, we need to know uh, two more items that uh, uh, are not what uh, we call that are not our vector quantities. These stresses we are calling in, uh, from uh, the geometrical uh, point of view, we, we call it vector quantity. Why we call it vector quantity? Because these stresses have a magnitude, have a, a, a amount, and have a direction. Okay, uh, for UCS and PP, uh, UCS is called the uh, unconfined compressive strength. And we are gonna get through uh, uh, what is meant by UCS. Uh, PP, it is a poor pressure. It's a pressure exerted by the, hydro, uh, uh, by the fluid found in the pores of the, uh, of the rock. So uh, the UCS and the poor pressure are also stresses that counteract the horizontal stresses, but they have not they haven't any direction. They act on all directions. So it is, uh, they are called the sc scalar one. <coughs> and this is a diagram that's uh, uh, demonstrates the difference between speed and velocity as a, a vector quantity and a, a scalar quantity. So uh, <coughs> for a geomechanics, uh, for drilling, we need to drill a well with uh, a mud weight, a mud weight is uh, a, a, a mud, uh, this is a mud used in the drilling to, to maintain a balance for, for us as a drillers 
to complete or to uh, uh, to drill a section. So uh, for, from the point of view of the geomechanics, of, uh, from the point of view of drilling, we have a main two hazards that occur with the drilling. We have what we call the kick, and we have what we call a loss of, a loss of circulation or loss of circulation. Uh, so uh, the kick uh, arises from the kick arises from when the mud weight is below the poor pressure or the pressure of the uh, of the uh, fluid in the rock. We have we will have a kick. Okay, this is the left side of the the balance, and the right side of the balance is the loss of separation. When the mud weight exceeded what we call the fracture gradient, we're gonna have a loss of separation. Loss of separation means that <coughs> the mud weight can exert some weight on the formation and make it uh, fractioning. After the fraction, the mud is being uh, is going through this fracture, and the mud and the mud column that I'm drilling with is gonna uh, is gonna decrease. Okay. Uh, another use of geomechanics, it uh, let me uh, and, uh, ask a question for you. How can, how can you interpret this uh, image? So I need one to tell me how can he interpret this image? So, no one is answering, so I'm gonna tell it. Uh, this image is mainly uh, can be interpreted as earth on fire. Earth on fire. Uh, another thing that's happened lately, uh, we have uh, the main entrepreneur uh, Elon Musk stated in uh, in uh, in tweet in a Twitter that he uh, I am donating a hundred million. Dollar, yes, the door toward the price for best carbon capturing technology and the storage technology. Okay, and uh, the left side of the, this presentation, the left the downside of this presentation, shows the carbon dioxide emitted from uh, from uh, 1925 to 2020 in Kofi Banadamic. So we have an issue globally. What is the issue? It's global warming. Global warming mainly arises from uh, fuel consumption around the world. So uh, in USA, Canada, uh, Australia, Australia, Iceland, I think, they use a technology called CCS, carbon dioxide storage, uh, carbon, sorry, carbon dioxide capturing and storage. How to the, what is the deal of carbon dioxide storage with ge geomechanics? Okay, let's us uh, go through a video. That's uh, demonstrate what is the CCS and its uh, and the effect of uh, our sorry or the application of geomechanics in this uh, type of uh, energy or type of uh, of uh, storage? Greenhouse gas emissions, global climate change. We are all facing the same challenges and need to work together to develop solutions. Carbon dioxide or CO2 comes from many sources: the decay of plant and animal matter, fires and volcanoes. Even our breathing emits CO2. The way we live has a cumulative impact on our environment. Every time we drive our cars or heat our homes or turn on the lights, most of us are using energy that comes from fossil fuels. Burning fossil fuels creates emissions, including CO2. Industrialization and rising population levels around the world have increased the demand for energy and meeting that demand increases the emissions being released into the atmosphere. CO2 is one of the many greenhouse gases being emitted into the air from both natural sources and human activity. So what can Alberta do to meet our growing energy needs? Solar, wind, and other renewable sources will play a more important role in Alberta's energy future, but they cannot currently replace oil and gas. So we must develop our fossil fuels in a cleaner, more environmentally responsible way. That's what carbon capture and storage will allow us to do. The government of Alberta has taken a lead role in committing to reduce emissions using carbon capture and storage. This technology, also known as CCS, 
is outlined in the 2008 Climate Change Strategy as the most effective way to help Alberta meet its emission reduction goals. The Government of Alberta is investing $2 billion to help develop three to five large-scale projects which will capture, transport, and store the CO2. CCS is a tested and proven technology. Its ability to reduce carbon dioxide emissions is recognized around the world by groups such as the International Energy Agency and the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. CO2 collected during the carbon capture and storage process can be pumped into an oil reservoir to help increase production. It can also be pumped kilometers deep below the Earth's surface where it will be permanently sealed. Let's take a closer look at how this is done. Many industries, including coal-fired electricity plants, cement plants, oil sands upgraders, and oil refineries, use fossil fuels to run their facilities. This creates CO2 emissions. The first step in CCS is filtering the carbon dioxide from other emissions. Next, the carbon dioxide is compressed for transport. It can either be sent to its destination through a pipeline or put into a tanker and trucked. Captured carbon has been safely transported by a truck in Alberta for more than two decades, primarily for enhanced oil recovery. In fact, you've probably already passed a tanker containing CO2 on the highway. There are also a few smaller enhanced oil recovery projects in Alberta using a pipeline. One of the world's largest CCS project pipes carbon from a plant in North Dakota to Weyburn, Saskatchewan. Since 2007, approximately 10 million tons of carbon dioxide has safely traveled more than 300 kilometers and given new life to a depleting oil field. Enhanced oil recovery has tremendous potential to help increase production from Alberta's existing oil fields. When carbon dioxide is used in enhanced oil recovery, it's injected into an oil formation to help the oil flow more freely. That means less hard to reach oil is left in the ground. It also means energy revenues and jobs for Albertans. Research shows that billions of barrels of conventional oil may be recoverable using enhanced oil recovery in Alberta. There may also be opportunity for enhanced natural gas recovery. CO2 not used in enhanced oil recovery can be injected into very deep geological reservoirs for permanent storage. The Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin is the geological feature that has held the energy reserves for eons. Once the oil or gas is extracted, the depleted reservoir becomes an ideal place to safely store carbon dioxide. The CO2 is sealed in the depleted reservoir by the rock structure, and the well used to inject the carbon is then sealed with concrete to prevent leakage. The well is then monitored. Carbon capture and storage is being successfully used around the world. In Canada, it has mostly been used for enhanced oil recovery. In Algeria and Norway, CCS is being used for long-term storage of carbon dioxide. In Norway, offshore natural gas contains a high level of carbon dioxide, which needs to be removed before the gas is shipped. The CO2 has been stored and sealed one kilometer below the ocean floor since 1996. In Algeria, 1.2 million tons of carbon dioxide has been captured and stored annually since 2004. $2 billion announced by the government of Alberta in 2008 will help produce CCS projects that will be up and running by 2015. This is an investment in environmental protection and part of Alberta's contribution to the global climate change challenge. The projects are expected to reduce emissions by 5 million tons each year starting in 2015. That's the same as taking 1 million vehicles for about one third of Alberta's as cars and trucks off of the roads. This funding will help establish Alberta as a global leader in CCS technology. That expertise can then be shared with the world. Alberta is already a leader in energy development. This investment in the science of solutions will help make Alberta a leader in CCS technology as well. CCS could be used in coal-fired electricity plants, 
oil refineries, and other large emitters of carbon dioxide. These projects will help Alberta improve CCS technology and reduce costs. CCS will ensure Alberta's economy remains strong while doing what's best for the environment. CCS is not a silver bullet solution to climate change, but it is a technology that will significantly reduce emissions while scientists develop new energy innovations for the future. The benefits of CCS will be felt over time as our environmental footprint is reduced. It's a major and important step that we will take now to help preserve our world for future generations. Here's how to find out more. So uh, as the narrator said, in the, we are going to use the CS project to save the world for the next generation. So uh, as the, uh, you are all, all uh, 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 as you all see, the future of uh, oil and gas is being uh, directed to a more sustainable energy environment. So uh, this is done by uh, uh, US, uh, US uh, Canada, uh, Germany, uh, all, uh, all the, the countries around the world. This also has been uh, been uh, been promoted in oil and gas industry as uh, the most uh, most uh, experienced operator around the world, like uh, Shell, BBE, Total, uh, has been changing its vision from oil and gas to be a green. So this is one of the uh, upcoming potential discipline to work on. This is advice for you, for you all. So uh, as you see, this is a project that has been operated around the world. So we, it is not, uh, uh, it's not a rocket science, but it, uh, the, this uh, countries have been working on this project for, for, for many decades. Uh, as uh, the, the narrator said in the video, this is the, our capturing carbon dioxide from uh, oil refineries, cementing plants, and they are transporting it through trucks or pipelines, and they are injecting uh, this carbon dioxide to the earth to help in uh, enhanced oil recovery or for a permanent storage like uh, Norway and Algeria and Alberta. So as the uh, as the uh, the, uh, the carbon dioxide is being bumped through uh, through uh, the earth into uh, an oil reservoir. This reservoir is being vertically by a lateral sea and uh, laterally by a fault or a benching out or uh, otherwise uh, what is the structure it's being trapped by. So from the uh, geomechanics uh, application, we need to uh, uh, perform what we called in the first slide I have shown you, a trap integrity uh, analysis. A trap integrity analysis need, uh, can be performed on the cap rock. I need to know how, uh, or not how, how many pressure can be held by this cap rock before it's being fracturing and the carbon dioxide that I am pumping is escaping. That's why the narrator said in the video, we need a monitoring phase in carbon dioxide uh, or uh, CCS projects. So this is uh, being the application of geomechanics in the uh, CCS project, okay? Another use of geomechanics is, uh, this is a reserve estimated by uh, uh, how much uh, website. Uh, uh, so, what we will have after the oil is being completely uh, produced, what we are going to do. The, I'm talking about conventional oil. So, as many countries has been, uh, 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 this is also a slide for, sorry, this is also a slide for carbon dioxide storage. And this can demonstrate also the application of geomechanics in the carbon dioxide storage. This is, we have, the, uh, we have the reservoir. Here we have the cap rock, and we here have the well that I am injecting the carbon dioxide through. So this is the carbon dioxide, and we have a pressure existed by the pumped carbon dioxide on the cap rock. So I need to monitor 
how much I will pump in this reservoir before this cap broke is being uh, deformed, was being fracturing. It's being fractioning, and the carbon dioxide can escape to, uh, to overlying layers and can introduce many, many problems. Okay. Uh, one of the main, main being promoted source of renewable energy nowadays is the geothermal projects. So uh, we have here a video about what is the geothermal energy and what uh, we, uh, what we, uh, what is the application of geomechanics in geothermal energy production. So let we go through the video. Renewable Energy 101. If you've ever observed an erupting volcano or the geysers at Yellowstone National Park, <coughs> you've seen geothermal energy in action. The Earth's crust is made of rocks and water. Deep below that is a layer of hot molten rock called magma, which is even hotter than the sun's surface. The heat just over six miles below the surface contains 50,000 times more energy than all the oil and natural gas resources in the world. Releasing a small amount of that heat in the right way can create electricity. A well drilled a couple of miles deep can capture the rising hot water and steam. That steam spins a turbine and a generator produces electricity. Geothermal is one of the least explored sources of renewable energy in the U.S., and most of us probably don't spend much time thinking about it. But since it's a pollution-free, renewable source of energy that's consistently reliable, at least it has been for the past 4.5 billion years, for the past 4.5 billion years, at least... I need to, 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 to highlight the, a term has been, uh, been, been uh, used uh, nowadays, it's a pollution-free or a green, a green source of energy. This is one of the uh, uh, source of energy that the main companies like BPHL, uh, uh, Total are working nowadays all over the world. Okay, so uh, geothermal energy, as, as the narrator said in the video, it is uh, uh, a type of energy that is found beneath the earth. It's found through uh, magma intrusions or volcanics. These volcanics have uh, abnormal heat that heated the water found in the earth. So I can use this water or the, the steam, the steam arises from this water to generate electricity through the turbine, which I am going to change the heat energy to kinetic energy from kinetic energy to electricity, okay? So what has to be with geomechanics, what is the relation between geothermal and ge geomechanics? So as you are seeing in this video, we have two production wells that are stated in uh, are found in green, okay? And we have what we call an injection well. This injection well is used to inject cold water because the, the geothermal reservoirs are a, a, a closed loop. We have uh, we have uh, we haven't uh, uh, calculate reserve in geothermal because we after we uh, we produce the hot water from the ground we can inject a cold water from a well and this uh, cold water is being. Uh, steamed by the effect of uh, abnormal temperature and being produced through the production well. So we have a closed loop. We have a continuous source of energy uh, from the geothermal uh, point of view. And that's why geothermal is being uh, mapped out for the, uh, the best uh, renewable source of energy nowadays. <coughs> okay. Uh, as we stated, uh, injection of water can also uh, in the uh, geothermal reservoir, we have also the, the main structure. We have a cap rock, and we have also a fracturing or fractures or, or whatever. Uh, a reservoir is being trapped, as like uh, we are seeing in uh, an oil an oil reservoir. So uh, uh, this uh, reservoir or this cap rock found uh, above the geothermal reservoir must be monitored before any problem arises from fracturing of the formation of this cap rock, uh, goes through the above layer. So the geomechanics application play an important uh, role in this uh, discipline. <coughs> okay. Uh, 
Okay, the, uh, we have also, uh, this is a project, uh, a map, a global map for the power generation project that have been found all, uh, all over the world. As you can see, we have uh, a huge use of geothermal reservoir because it's, as I've stated before, the, this uh, type of uh, renewable uh, energy is a continuous source, continuous source of green energy. Okay. Uh, what we can see from this uh, from this photo is uh, the what uh, what so called the uh, unconventional reservoir. This is the Cambridge, Cambridge Shale from uh, US. This is the main source of unconventional uh, oil shale. Okay, this is another video to to uh, to see the effect of hydraulic fracking. And what is this application of hydro uh, of uh, geomechanics in hydraulic fracking, and what the, what we have meant by the term induced seismicity? So this is a video from uh, NBC4, uh, a channel in the US, uh, will uh, show you what we are uh, what we meant by induced seismicity. The past five years, oil and gas exploration have been economic booming in some parts of the country. The process of fracking, that's hydraulic fracturing, has an environmental cost. Meteorologist Ben Gelber is here to tell us about a new way to access some of those hazards that have really been rattling some of the nerves, Ben. And Mike and Ellie, some of the earliest oil and gas exploration happened right here in Ohio. But after years of decline, new technology using a mixture of water, sand, and chemicals injected into the rock at high pressure causes a chip fracture releasing natural gas, but a process that can also cause tremors. Ohio has multiple seismic zones in western and northeastern Ohio, from Cincinnati to Ashtabula. But after dozens of earthquakes were recorded around Youngstown and in Harrison County near drilling and injection well sites, Ohio two years ago began requiring well operators within three miles of a fault or seismically active area to install seismic monitors. Now, for the first time, U.S. Geological Survey scientists have formally mapped both human-induced and natural earthquake risk zones. The new U.S. Geological Survey report is focused on Harrison, Belmont, Guernsey, and Washington counties in eastern Ohio. That's where scientists believe there is a high risk for future earthquakes, where toxic wastewater is re-injected thousands of feet into rock under increased pressure. The new earthquake hazard map also rates Oklahoma second only to Alaska an earthquake frequency in the United States ahead of California. The study puts 7 million people at home and work at risk around the country, including parts of eastern Ohio. Now, the seismic network where I was today at Owl Creek State Park, created by Ohio EMA and monitored by the state's geological survey since 1999, is a vital research laboratory reporting more than 100 small quakes in Ohio. These studies and the national study help protect residents by broadly defining Risk zones, fracking related quakes have been minor. The strongest natural earthquake in Ohio registered 5.4 in Shelby County in March 1937. Already, thanks, Ben. Interesting debate. Okay, this is another video for the other fracking. But the majority have never experienced the impact of this geological event. For the citizens of Oklahoma, earthquakes are a far too common threat. According to the USGS, the state has experienced multiple earthquakes in the past couple of weeks. On Sunday, November 6th, in one of the world's largest oil hubs, Cushing, Oklahoma, a 5.0 magnitude earthquake occurred. Tremors were felt as far away as Iowa, Illinois, and Texas. Dozens of buildings suffered damage, but there were no fatalities. Man-made factors contributed to the event. The surface of the earth is made of tectonic plates, which look like huge puzzle pieces. These plates are continuously moving. The edges of these tectonic plates are jagged and rough. When they travel, the rough edges of these plates collide and create friction. When they move apart, it results in an earthquake by nature. In Oklahoma, many earthquakes, but not all, are beyond natural. These events are induced by wastewater disposal from fracking and oil drilling. Wastewater is a product at- Okay, let's go through the use of the geomechanics uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, hydraulic fracking, how, how geomechanics will help in hydraulic fracking. 
as we uh, as you all uh, as you many of you know hydraulic fracking is a process to frack the oil shale and then produce uh, the uh, the uh, let me use also and uh, and uh, produce sorry uh, gas and oil from uh, from an unconventional oil shell or oil reservoirs so uh, injection water or water disposal waste is being used this uh, well used to pump water uh, at a very 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 high pressure in the uh, in the oil shale and uh, to frack this oil shale so after fracking of oil shale uh, uh, faults can move this uh, can cause Seismicity. This can cause and induce earthquake. Faults can move because the uh, faults uh, have been uh, phased uh, through a high pressure disposal of uh, water coming from the uh, hydraulic fracking operation. So uh, this is a lifetime for a geomechanical model. We use uh, geomechanics in uh, oil and gas industry from the exploration phase to the abandonment phase. We use, uh, use geomechanics in pro pressure prediction. In the exploration phase, in the appraisal phase, we uh, we uh, use the geomechanics from the point of view of water stability, port seas, and fracture permeability. In the development phase, we have uh, two uh, main uh, topic: we have a sand production prediction, we have a compaction, we have a casing shearing and substance. Uh, from the harvest phase, we uh, we are going to uh, uh, knock the door at the fracture simulation and the reflect and the hydraulic fracking process and the depletion and the, uh, the problem associated with the depletion of oil reservoirs. Okay, Yet, this is the main image you, you need to, uh, to, to put it in your mind. Okay, in, we have a left, a, left, a left and right issues. From the point of drilling, we have a safest mud weight. This, mud, this is a mud weight. We have a too, a too low mud weight or a too high mud weight. Okay. When the mud weight is being in the safest window, we have a, what we call the engage hole. We have an engage uh, well with no, no problems in it. Okay. When the mud weight is being low relative to what we call shear ferry gradient, we have a term called a breakout or shield failure. This breakout, it is a breaking of the rocks in a specified direction, okay? So when the mud weight is being lowered be below uh, the poor pressure, in this case, we have a collapse, a poor hole collapse, and, uh, and can be arise uh, also to uh, kick, uh, well kick or a blow out. On the other hand, on the right hand, when the mud weight is too high above what we call the fracture gradient, okay? The fracture gradient is, uh, is a fracture at which the, uh, the rock can be uh, fractured. And we can introduce a fracture through the rock by increasing the mud weight above the fracture gradient. So, as the mud weight is be, uh, uh, getting uh, too high above the fracture gradient, we have a mud losses. After it is being high also, you know, extremely high, we have what we call loss of, loss of circulation. Loss of circulation arises from this fracture is being pro propagating away from the pore uh, hole and uh, leads to uh, the uh, complete loss of uh, the, high, uh, the mud weight uh, columns that I'm drilling with, okay? So from the uh, from the graph we have a mud weight 8.3 to 18.3 a uh, graph and this in the x axis we have a depth <coughs> and the the, the uh, red uh, sorry the, the blue color is the pore pressure this is the curve which I don't need to uh, to go below it because when I get below it I will have a, uh, I will have a, uh, 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 sorry, I will have a, uh, sorry, a breakout according to this uh, image, or I will have a uh, uh, bo uh, borehole uh, collapse or 
it goes either in uh, less case scenario, we will have a, a blowout in the well. Okay, and the upper limit for us is being the fracture pressure, which I, I doesn't need to go above it. Okay, so the mud weight, I'm drilling with a mud weight like uh, 10 PPG, with the PPG is a uh, pound per gallon. Okay. A pound per gallon. I'm drilling with a, sorry, excuse me for a minute. I'm going to get the charger on from for uh, my laptop.
Okay, sorry, sorry. We have we have a technical issue. Are you hearing me right now? Okay, let's uh, let's uh, uh, slide again. You had them to I'm not wait. I'm not wait. With the lower room, uh, the one is. Uh, can you mute yourself? Barbara, can you mute yourself? The one is Abrahman, can you mute? Okay. Thank you, Abrahman. Thank you. I'm sorry for that. Yeah. Okay, this is uh, this is the image uh, for a uh, curve. It is the uh, x-axis is the uh, mud weight I'm using to drill a well, and the y-axis is being the depth as I go down through the well. Okay. Uh, the, the the blue curve it is the lower limit for me. I don't want to exceed this blue curve. Because when I get, sorry, I get lower than this curve, we gonna have what we call in the earlier slide, a shield failure. And shield failure can be, uh, 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 rises up to uh, what we call the collapse. After the collapse, we have gonna have a, a blue out. So this is the lower limit for me. The upper limit for me is the green line. The green line is the fracture pressure. So I do not want to increase my weight to be higher than fracture pressure. Otherwise, I will have a mud losses or loss of circulation, okay? So my mud weight window will be in this shaded area. So I am gonna drill a well from this, uh, from this section, from uh, let's say uh, 500 feet with around uh, 11 ppg. As I go down through the depths, the 11 ppg is still uh, not uh, increased by me. So, 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 until I reach this depth, let's say it is 4,000 feet. When I continue with 11, uh, 11 ppg through this uh, section, we're gonna have a blowout or a breakout. So I uh, stop drilling, pull, uh, pull out of the hole, and increase the mud weight, okay? I'm gonna do that, increasing the mud weight to, uh, let's say 16 ppg. I'm gonna drill from the surface and with the 16 ppg. So we have a problem here. We have a 16 ppg is exceeding the fracture pressure in the above lying layers. So what I am gonna to do, I'm gonna to case the well from the surface to the point um, at which I'm going to increase the mud weight. Why, why I'm doing that? In order to not have any loss of circulation in above, uh, the above layer, while, while I am increasing the mud weight from 11 ppg to 16 ppg. Okay? 
as as I continue uh, dwelling from this depth with the 16 PPG, I'm going to dwell 16, 16, 16 PPG until I reach a critical moment. This moment, when I still using the 16 PPG, I'm gonna get lower support pressure. So I'm gonna stop drilling. Before increasing mud weight, I'm gonna case the hole from the zero to the point at which I'm gonna to increase the mud weight. So this is the application of geomechanics in the casing design. Casing design is not also depend on geomechanics, also it's depend on another uh, engineering issue. Okay, but this is the casing design uh, from the point of view of geomechanics. Okay, geomechanics uh, modeling uh, mainly uh, uh, can be some uh, modeling can be summarized in. Okay, let's uh, data auditing, data gathering. We gather the data from uh, well logs. We gather the data from drilling or from the offset well. In uh, after that, we uh, we are making what we call it a well summary. It is a summary for the casings that found in the well, the main problems uh, found in the offset wells, and how we can mitigate it in the upcoming next well. After then, we uh, we uh, divide our layers according zero to their mechanical stratigraphy. According to you, we have a carbonate, we have shale, we are dealing with sand, we are dealing with basement fractured rocks. After then, we uh, calculate what we called it SV, the, uh, the uh, vertical stress, the static, or uh, the, uh, the overburden stress. After then, we calculate and calibrate the pool pressure. Okay. After then, we have the mechanical properties of our rock. So uh, we have uh, two main uh, uh, inputs in the geomechanics. We have the input, the human input, which is the mud weight I'm using at the drilling. And we have the, the input that I can control, which, which is the, uh, the strengths or the mechanical properties of the layer which I'm de dealing with, OK? Uh, after then, we have uh, the stress direction. As I said earlier, these stresses have a magnitude and have a direction. So I need to know uh, their direction and their magnitude. So the stress direction uh, 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 step, it is uh, using uh, what we called it in the oil exploration or oil and gas industry, FMI or formation micro image, or uh, what we called it uh, caliber, M, caliber log to know the direction of the stresses, of the present day stress, okay? After then, we, call, uh, we calculate the minimum horizontal stresses. After the minimum, we calculate the maximum horizontal stresses. After then, we put all the, uh, all the calculated and calibrated data in failure analysis. What's meant, what is being meant by failure analysis? Failure analysis is uh, uh, inputting the stresses. It's a type of simulation to input the stresses and the mechanical properties of the layer I'm dealing with and get an image of how the rock is going to fail when I'm using the specific mud weight that, I'm use, that I have already used or that I'm going to be using in the upcoming well. Okay. After that, we have a well proof trajectory analysis. This is to study the geomechanical issue in that uh, the, uh, when we using any deviation well in any direction. After then we have what we call slip and direction tendency. It is a, a term related to uh, trap integrity. That a term related to trap integrity. This is a mainly uh, a robust workflow for a geomechanical model. Okay. So uh, uh, this is the data which I am gonna collect. This is the regional stress data, regional technical and structure, the overburden stress. We have gonna calculate the overburden stress from the density logs. We have uh, the proof pressure. We're gonna calculate and calibrate the proof pressure from RFT, our repeat formation tester, which is a, a log that measures the pool pressure inside a well, an oil well. We have uh, uh, the least principal stress, with the, which is the minimum horizontal stress. This is, can be calculated and calibrated from the many frags. We have the stress orientation. We have uh, the stress orientation from six or four or six arm caliber rock or FMI data. 
We have a bull, bull farrier. We have to uh, to know our fault and fracture and biddings. This come from uh, seismic, come from otherwise, uh, from uh, fault cuts inside the wells. Uh, rock strengths, which is mainly the me mechanical uh, earth properties or mechanical rock properties. This comes from better physical data and laboratory test. Uh, laboratory test like uh, the uniaxial uh, test. This is a test done in uh, the lab to know the strengths of the uh, core data, okay? Bidding and the structures uh, of the uh, underlying logs come from what we call it the uh, meter log, okay? This is also a type of a presentation of a geomechanical model. This is well, it's called a uh, drill map. Uh, let this uh, drill map, this is a quantitative analysis in uh, geomechanics. This is a state, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lithology found in our well, and the state. This is the lower curve, which is, uh, it is mainly support pressure. And the upper curve is a, the fracture gradient. And this is the two, uh, two lines inside, it is a, the mud window that I can go through. Uh, that, uh, this is here uh, the risk found in uh, the offset wells. And uh, this risk has been uh, analysis and have been uh, 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 characterized in uh, uh, severe risks, concerned no hazards. Okay. So uh, as, as we're going to go to the, the, uh, the area from 2000, I think, 2000. Uh, 2700, we have here a, a severe risk. So I'm gonna uh, give this uh, drill map to the driller. When we uh, when you are going to drill this uh, section in the well, please please be careful that we are having a wool bore issue or severe risk in this area. This is a type of presentation of the mechanical model. Okay. Okay, uh, for for who uh, who doesn't know the drilling rig components, this is a video to show you the drilling components of the rig to be familiarized with the drilling components of the rig. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, uh, let's stop the video down here because I have uh, because I have uh, almost ten minutes to go, and uh, we need to go through the presentation. Okay, uh, this is a, a slide that shows a difference, uh, a critical difference that many many uh, geomechanics engineers doesn't take in their consideration. The difference between what we called ESD and ECD. Uh, ESD is an uh, abbreviation for our uh, equivalent static density, equivalent static uh, mud density, okay? Uh, ECD is a core abbreviation for equivalent stat, uh, sorry, uh, circulating density. At what is the difference between both? The difference is that the mud weight the mud bit, this is a mud, uh, what we call the mud tanks. This is uh, uh, the tanks that have the mud weight I'm drilling within it. Okay. When uh, the mud engineer measures the weight of this uh, of this mud, it gives it uh, ESD equivalent static density in in, in its static uh, phase. Okay. After that. This mud weight is being sucked by the mud suction uh, through the mud suction line. By the, the effect of mud bump goes uh, through uh, goes through the discharge pump to what we call it the stem pipe to the rotary hose. This rotary hose goes through the uh, the drill pipes, going through the drill pipes. After that, it's gonna flow out from the bit nozzles. From the journey of mud from its from its uh, mud uh, tanks to the bed nozzle, it loses some pressure. So the acting pressure in the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the formation will be lower than the mud, the mud weight in the mud tanks because it loses many many pressure as it goes through its journey. So for a ECD, which is mainly critical for me as a geomechanics engineer, I need to increase the effect of this pressure loss on this on this uh, mud weight measured by mud engineer to get the correct mud weight that mainly acts on the formation. This is the point from uh, the difference uh, between an ECD and ESD. Okay, and this is uh, some calculations that. Yeah, we use as a geomechanics engineer to uh, to calculate the ESD. The ESD is equals B, uh, S, BS. It is the pressure loss from the journey of mud from its mud tanks to the bed nozzles. We have a factor here 0 0.052 multiply the true vertical depth of the well plus mud weight. What I meant by mud weight? I meant by this mud weight. It's ESD, the mud weight that the mud engineer measures in the mud tanks. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm going through uh, quickly through the presentation. Uh, this is a tip for you. Geomechanics branch deals with the present day stress. I'm I'm not dealing with any any tectonic stress that happens uh, like we say uh, 10 years ago, or uh, at, uh, sorry, a million years ago, we going to deal with the stresses. I mean by stresses, the SV, S minimum, S maximum, that happens while we are talking right now, okay? <coughs> sorry. This is a world stress map. This is uh, stresses compliant uh, by the uh, GFZ uh, Institute in Germany by uh, Mark Zobek, uh, Oliver Hypack, one of the pioneers in geomechanics industry. This is shows the, uh, the stresses that acting on the Earth's surface. In, uh, let's say we have an example here in uh, Norway. We have here a compressional state. We have here the Earth is in a compressional uh, motion, OK? In the North Sea area, OK? This is a present day stress. As we go uh, further in uh, this area, we have a northwest fault that arises from a rifting happening mainly in the Cretaceous. So 
when I'm gonna do my geomechanical modeling, I'm gonna deal with the present day stress, not the existential stress that happened in the Cretaceous or in the Jurassic. Okay. Uh, sorry for that because I have a meeting right uh, in a five minutes, and we can also uh, make it in another webinars. Uh, and uh, go through how we can make a geomechanical modeling and how we can uh, uh, use this geomechanical in renewable energy. Because from my point of view, uh, this era is the era of renewable energy. Uh, this is the era of clean and renewable energy. Thank you all and thank uh, Reservoir Solution for this webinar. Uh, so we have uh, here a room for questions for only five minutes. Okay, uh, we have some questions. The first, uh, sir, how to calculate the bore pressure and the friction pressure? The bore pressure and friction pressure have is being calculated through uh, what we call it uh, Eaton uh, equation through uh, the uh, using of uh, vertical stress and the is the use of uh, what relation of bore pressure. But I need to calibrate this poor pressure. I need to calibrate it. it is uh, my calculation is uh, is right or it's wrong or it is uh, so. I need to uh, a way of calibration. You can use this calibration by the mean of uh, the pressure uh, logs. The pressure logs that come from actually actually a data come from a well. So I can I, I calculate the uh, poor pressure and fracture pressure using the ATO method. Uh, after that, I calibrate this data using the information that actually happens in the well, or actually measured in the well. Okay. Uh, okay. So I have another question. Uh, if I don't have many frag data, and okay. I do the equations for estimating the min the minimum horizontal stress. What okay. it, what is the constant strain value I can use into the equation? The correct strain value you can use for the minimum horizontal stress is when you don't have any mini frag data, you can use the leak of test data, or we can use uh, data found in mud log, uh, mud losses data. At the mud losses data, you have been used a mud weight that's higher than the fracture pressure or the minimum horizontal stress, and this can be uh, a, a figure for the minimum horizontal stress data. Okay. Okay, you can uh, depend on the drilling debt, the actual drilling debt. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I have another question. How to calculate EMV? Sorry, I, the aim? How to calculate the EMV? EMV, it is the equivalent mud weight. Uh, it is a provision for equivalent mud weight. It is not a calculation. It is uh, mud weight can be uh, uh, demonstrated in uh, bounds per gallon, PPG or in a PSI. So okay. the equivalent mud weight, it is uh, the conversion from PBG, it is a pound per gallon, to a, P a PSI or vice versa. It can be done by equation called, the uh, equation that is uh, PSI, PSI, mud weight in the PSI, equals 0 0.052 times the true vertical depth times the mud weight in PBG. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, we have another question. If you have time, uh, what is the BS to the ESD, ES, ECD formula? Uh, the ECD, ECD is always greater than the, the ESD. So uh, ECD is calculated is a, a calculated value, uh, rather than the ESD. ESD is a measured value by the man engineer. So when we uh, we calculate the annual pressure loss uh, from the journey of uh, mud from the mud tanks to the mud uh, the bit nozzles we can increase this value to the measured value of esd and we gonna get the equivalent circulating density which is always always much greater than the esd yeah uh, he is also asking about the bs into the ecd formula the BS is the pressure loss, the pressure loss that happened from the journey of the mud, from the mud tanks to the bit, bit nozzle. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you for this interesting uh, webinar and uh, also for your time and the effort to exert or to excel it price a nice presentation. Uh, thank you, Engineer Islam. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Abraham. Thank you. And we are going to also have uh, another sessions on uh, the use of geomechanics. Uh, this will be a great webinar, the use of geomechanics in uh, renewable energy. I think this yeah. will be uh, very, very uh, good webinars because our vision, as you also see, it's going from uh, fossil fuel to green energy. Yeah, yeah, we hope that to be soon, inshallah. Okay, inshallah will be soon. Okay. okay. Thank you for the attendees that uh, for listening for our webinar today. And also, in case that you wanted to get a certificate for our webinar, please, please fill into the certification form that uh, I sent its link into the Zoom chat. Also, in case that you wanted to uh, enroll for our next course for uh, production optimization, you can also register it in by the link that will be sent into the link now. Okay, uh, I will close our session uh, in about five minutes and I sent all the record links, links into the Zoom chat. So you can fill into the link for certification and also in case you wanted to register for our next course, you can fill into the form of registration sent into the Zoom chat. Thank you all and hope to see you into the next webinar. Thank you.